If you love classic cars, then Donald loves you. It's amazing how much development clever engineers can pull out of a basic package. I'm driving a 1970 Ford Mustang Boss 429. And as one of the later examples of the first generation Ford Mustang, with this incredibly powerful 429 V8, it's hard to believe that the underpinnings of this car were designed in the late 1950s as the Falcon economy car. There are things that uh, come up every now and then that remind you of the humble beginnings of the Mustang, uh, not least of which is the fact that when you get 375 horsepower and 450 foot-pounds of torque in the underpinnings of an economy car, some things are bound to be compromised. And this car is a bit of a compromise. The Boss 302, which grew out of the Ford Mustang Trans Am program, is a very different animal than this car, which was a very clever dodge on the part of Ford, no pun intended, to homologate a big engine for NASCAR racing. And the NASCAR rules, of course, said that that engine had to be available in a showroom available car, but they didn't say that it had to be in the same body that you were going to race. So Ford had these engines stuffed into the Mustang Fastback, the Mach 1 body, and raced using the Torino Talladega body which had considerable advantages in NASCAR racing at the time, which of course then was still closely related to the cars you bought on the showroom floor. They had not yet gotten to the point where it was simply a tube frame with a body mock-up shell on top. They actually did have the underpinnings of the actual production car. And frankly, it's a sign that I really miss. I grew up in a family, as many of you know, that didn't have a car until I was 12 years old. We lived in New York City and didn't need one. But I did watch NASCAR highlights on TV. I did read about NASCAR racing. And it was great to be able to see all the cars that I loved on the racetrack, cars that looked just like them. And to me, a lot of that's lost with the whole silhouette. Uh, fiberglass bodies with decals on them to make them look like cars, two-door versions of four-door cars, things like that, but I digress. The Boss 429 was a car built to do one thing, and that was go as fast as it possibly could in as straight a line as possible. And it's interesting to see how this relates to Mustang performance when we drive the original Mustang performance car, the Shelby GT350. But without giving too much away of that ride to come, we can talk about this one. There's not a lot of lateral stability in this car, as you might expect for a car that's designed to go straight. And it is a heavy engine. Although, I'd have to look at the specifications to see exactly how much heavier the 429 is than the 302. But it just feels heavy, even if it doesn't weigh a lot more. There's also that very strange combination, which is almost particular to 1970s muscle cars, U.S. muscle cars. So, very peculiar to American muscle cars of this period is a rather curious combination of tremendous power, a somewhat compliant but ultimately crashy ride, and strangely light steering. The steering is its like you're driving a Thunderbird. There's almost no feedback at all through the wheel, and there's a good probably three, four degrees of movement in the wheel before the car actually turns. Now, some of that is down to the polyglass tires that it's running, but that actually helps give it the ride it has. And it's the way these cars were built. To put modern, very square-shouldered radials on a car like this 
uh, would be, I think, quite strange and compromise its essential nature. But nonetheless, once you get used to what the car is going to do, you have a fair bit of confidence in it, but it's not a car that you really want to throw around a lot of curvy roads. But the power is astonishing. And it also delivers it in a way that is also slightly unexpected. You'd think that a big V8 like this, seven liters with 450 foot-pounds of torque, would have it immediately from, from the low end all the way up to the top. But this actually seems as if it's got a second power that when you come on cam of the car, it really picks up a totally different set of lungs. And of course, this great Hurst shifter, absolutely iconic. And it feels really great in the hand too. It's sort of the massive control that you'd expect for a car like this. It throws you back in the seat with every shift. You actually feel the power come on. And that's uniquely American. Nobody else delivers power like this. And it's also a car that seems much happier the faster it goes. But that's also because we're now in its element. A nice, smooth, straight road where you can put the power down with some confidence and not worry about having to do things like turn right and left. Delivers its peak power too fairly early. About 3,800, 4,000 RPM gives you all this engine's going to do. You don't need to rev it any further. I remember as a kid just thinking that these cars were absolutely amazing. And this is also finished in this great, the 1970s were a great time. Look at the color of this car. I mean, back in the 1970s, we had great colors. I love coloring cars. As it happens, all the cars I currently own are silver or gray. Um, that's through choice, some old, some new. But if they made colors like this today, how amazing the automotive landscape would look. And I think we've lost a lot because of that. But that's one of the things that also makes it great to drive a car like this because it is a time machine. It takes you back to another time, another place, a faster time, a faster place. This Ford is the boss. Ha, <laughs> ha.